I welcome you to another week of our four and a, to another week of our four and a half year verse by verse journey through all of God's inspired word. Let's open to Ezekiel chapter 24 where we broke off last session. This is a significant chronological marker and it is supernatural in nature. Uh, this is the time at which the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem begins. And Ezekiel, who is living many, many, many uh, days travel far to the north and a little bit east of Jerusalem, is told it's starting today. And so this is just another indicator for the people in Ezekiel's sphere of influence that he is definitely God's prophet. So Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 1. In the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month. So this is all from a Jewish standpoint uh, tied in with the reign of Nebuchadnezzar the king. So we're actually talking here about uh, five, let's see, let me get the exact dating here. Uh, The very last part of December of 590 BC, that's when the siege begins. So the word of he who is came to me. So this is the report of Ezekiel. Son of man, write down the name of this day, this very day. So make sure you mark it clearly in the record. The king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. And I cannot emphasize enough that there was no mechanism by which Ezekiel could have known the precise timing of this siege except by God's Holy Spirit. Because even the fastest relay horse running took more than a week to get information from down in Judea all the way back to Babylon City. Verse 3. Utter a parable to the rebellious house and say to them, Thus says he who is God. So here comes the the timely illustration to teach the people in exile. Set on the pot, set it on, pour in water also. So we have a picture here of getting ready to make a stew. Put in it the pieces of meat, all the good pieces, the thigh and the shoulder. Fill it with choice bones. Take the choicest one of the flock. Pile the logs under it. Boil it well. So we're making a very nice lamb stew or mutton stew. Boil it well. Seethe also its bones in it. Then, verse 6, therefore thus says he who is God, woe to the bloody city to the pot whose corrosion is in it and whose corrosion has not gone out of it. This is all related to something we saw earlier, that the people in Jerusalem were kind of thinking themselves as one great pot and all the people in it were the the meat and the chunks of vegetables, all all the, the things that make a good stew. And God had told them at the time, oh yeah, your stew all right, but you're actually a stew of judgment. So God has returned back to that thematic idea. And so the pot here is Jerusalem, and it is rusted on the inside. It has corrosion in it, and the corrosion has not been taken care of. And so the big stew that's being put together is in a rotten pot. God continues, Take out of it piece after piece without making any choice, which means randomly. For the blood she has shed is in her midst. She put it on the bare rock. She didn't pour it out on the ground to cover it with dust. This is a reference to the requirements in the temple when they were butchering the sacrificial animals. They were supposed to take the blood not used in the ceremonies and pour it out in the bare earth to let the earth soak it up. 
when an Israeli went out to hunt wild game or they were butchering their own animals at home. They were always supposed to find open soil and let the blood drain into the ground, not putting it on rocky soil where it just laid out there in the open because blood was supposed to be respected since it represented life. In fact, it was life. The life is in the blood. So God is saying here that the Israelis of this time period had no respect for life, had no respect for the blood of life, and they are going to come under God's judgment because of that. Verse 8, to rouse my wrath, to take vengeance, I have set on the bare rock the blood she has shed that it may not be covered. So God is taking into account everything that has been done sinfully, including the murder of people or the using of the legal system to get people killed. Verse 9, therefore, thus says he who is God, woe to the bloody city, the murderous city, the, the blood guilt city. I also will make the pile great. Heap up the logs, kindle the fire, boil the meat well, mix in the spices and let the bones be burned up and then set it empty upon the coals that it may become hot and its copper may burn that its uncleanness may be melted in it, its corrosion consumed. So the picture is, go ahead and make your stew. I'm going to make it and I'm going to burn it all up and empty the pot, and then turn the pot upside down and burn it out to get a good fresh start. And this is, a, this is all related, remember, to the fact that God is going to empty the city of Jerusalem out of judgment, and then he is going to have it destroyed, including the temple, by the Babylonians so that he can start fresh again with the remnant that is up in exile right now. Verse 12, she has wearied herself with toil. Its abundant corrosion does not go out of it. Into the fire with its corrosion on account of your unclean lewdness because I would have cleansed you and you are not cleansed from your uncleanness. You shall not be cleansed anymore till I have satisfied my fury upon you. So God has tried repeatedly to get them to repent throughout their history, and they've resisted him. And so now they've crossed that point of no return where he's going to invoke the most severest part of the Deuteronomy uh, blessings and cursings. Uh, the cursing is, I will remove you from the promised land. I will destroy your sanctuaries. I will destroy your holy city. Verse 14, I am he who is. I've spoken, and it shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. I will not spare. I will not relent. According to your ways and your deeds, you shall be judged, declares he who is God. So God, making it clear here on the 10th day of the 10th month of the uh, ninth year of Zedekiah, judgment has fallen. The city is now under siege, and the only result at the end of all this will be destruction and desolation and exile. Verse 15, the word of he who is came to me, son of man, and remember that's God's pet name for Ezekiel. It has nothing to do with messianic things. Uh, it's the idea that he's a human. So son of man, behold, I am about to take the delight of your eyes away from you at a stroke. Uh, the delight of his eyes is a reference to his wife. Now, this is the first time that we've known for certain that Ezekiel is married. Marriage was the norm amongst the Israelis throughout their history, so we shouldn't be surprised by this. And now we find out that she either was already sick and now she's going to pass away, or perhaps uh, she suddenly becomes sick and passes away. But this is what God tells him. Yet you shall not mourn or weep, nor shall your tears run down. 
sigh, but not out loud. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind on your turban, that is, your, your head covering, and put on, or excuse me, put your shoes on your feet and do not cover your lips nor eat the bread of men. Now, this is describing the opposite of what would happen when somebody lost someone they loved. Uh, when you lost a loved one, you would go into a public mourning state. Uh, you would cry openly, and you would grieve outwardly. You would uh, take off uh, your head covering, and you would take off your shoes, and you would put your hand up to your mouth and cry. Uh, and uh, this is what he's told not to do. Don't act like a grieving widower. Just go on with your life as if it were a normal day. Now, this has got to be one of those tough times to be a prophet of God. We know that Ezekiel's been asked to do several other public demonstrations of prophecy. The most significant one I think that we were uh, impressed by was that he had to spend more than a year lying on his sides uh, out uh, in the open and eating a, uh, a, a maintenance level of food and drinking only enough water to stay hydrated uh, and to remain silent that whole time and play with a little diorama of the siege of Jerusalem. And he did that. Uh, and then he had to explain what it was about, that there was judgment coming. So he's already done things like that, big things. But now God has said, look, your wife's about to die. I need you to do another prophetic illustration to the people. Don't allow your grief to be public. You can sigh and be sad on the inside, but carry on your day as if it were a normal day. So that's all happening on the day that the siege of Jerusalem began, the 10th day of the 10th month. And remember, their days go from sunset to sunset. So during the daylight hours on that day in late December of 590. Verse 18, So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at the evening... So he tells them the siege has begun right now, down in Jerusalem. He tells that to them in the morning hours. When the evening rolled around, that is probably from late afternoon till sunset in that time frame, my wife died. On the next morning, I did as I was commanded. Next morning, he gets up, having been sad in his own private moments in his house. He gets up and he goes out and he carries on like he would normally carry on in a day. And immediately the people know that something's up. Why does he have himself dressed in normal clothing? Why is he even walking around outside of his house? Why isn't he crying out loud? Why isn't he grieving and mourning? So verse 19, the people said to me, Will you not tell us what these things mean for us, that you're acting thus? And then I said to them, The word of he who is came to me. Say to the house of Israel, Thus says he who is God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the delight of your eyes. Remember that phrase was a reference to Ezekiel's wife. The delight of his eyes. Now God is applying that to the temple. The temple is the delight of the eyes of the people. They're very proud about it. In fact, a few years earlier, uh, they had been warned to quit putting their trust in the Ark of the Lord, the Ark of the Lord, the Ark of the Lord, or the Temple of the Lord, the Temple of the Lord, Temple of the Lord, because they saw these as good luck talismans, that as long as they had these things, nothing bad could happen to them, because God wouldn't let it happen. 
So now God comes along and says, I'm going to trash the temple. The thing that you take such pride in, the thing that you love so much, the yearning of your soul and your sons and your daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. Now he is talking to people in Babylon, not very far from Babylon City, Jewish people that have already gone into exile. And so he tells them, starting today, God's going to take away the temple, and he's also going to kill many of your relatives, even some of your sons and daughters that you left behind when you were brought in exile to here. Verse 22, you shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips, nor eat the bread of men. Your turbans shall be on your heads, and your shoes on your feet, and you shall not mourn or weep, but you will rot away in your iniquities and groan to one another. So he says, you guys are going to go on as normal up here, while down there, tragedy is striking. Verse 24. Thus shall Ezekiel be to you a sign. According to all that he has done, you shall do. And when this comes, you will know that I am he who is God. So the prediction here is about them having a delayed grief. They don't even know for certain. I mean, they've got the prophet's word for this, and they should have trusted that. But they don't know for certain all the bad things that are happening at this very moment down in Jerusalem. But they will soon. But in the meantime, they're going to carry on life as usual. Verse 25, As for you, son of man, surely on the day when I take from them their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes and their soul's desire, and also their sons and daughters, on that day a fugitive will come to you to report to you the news. So eventually, those that survive all of this stuff, the, the, the siege that's just now starting is going to have a big burst of military activities, and there'll be some deaths, and people will run away, and some of them will try to run away up to Babylon. Others are going to be captured as survivors of some of these military operations and sent off to Babylon, relocated there. And so when the first of those fugitives arrive, they will report that on the 10th day of the 10th month, it all started. It all started falling apart. Verse 27, on that day, your mouth will be open to the fugitive and you shall speak and be no longer mute. And so you will be assigned to them and they will know that I am he who is. Now we find out again that God has Ezekiel go mute. He's done that before. And so now he apparently goes mute from the day he tells the Israelis the siege has started until the first fugitives arrive and confirm that reality. And then Ezekiel will speak out again. Now, chapter 25 has uh, some prophecies that may have been uh, written down right around this time. Uh, they are against some of the countries near Judea, which were already kind of giving Judea a hard time. And when they saw the Babylonians start military operations against Jerusalem, uh, they celebrated that. And so God wants it on the record that that bad attitude is going to bring judgment. Ezekiel 25, the word of he who is came to me, son of man, set your face toward the Ammonites and prophesy against them. Now the Ammonites are one of the two Lot family groups, Lot and Moab. And so they are tied in with the Abrahamic family, but they are very paganized. Uh, the Ammonites occupied the high uh, plateau area on the east side of the Jordan. They would have originally been bordered on northern Israel, uh, but now uh, they have kind of their own 
uh, independent area, but just temporarily because of this. Verse 3, say to the Ammonites, hear the word of he who is God. Thus says he who is God, because you said, aha, over my sanctuary when it was profaned, and over the land of Israel when it was made desolate, and over the house of Judah when they went into exile. Therefore, behold, I am handing you over to the people of the east for a possession, and they shall set their encampments among you and make their dwellings in your midst. So as the military operations progress against Judah, and the temple is clearly being assailed. The people of Ammon are like, yeah, serves them right. Glad it's happening. And God's response is, it's going to happen to you too. I'm going to bring the Babylonians against you, the children of the east. Uh, the east is a reference to Mesopotamia. Uh, continuing, they shall eat your fruit and they shall drink your milk. So they're going to come in and take your resources. I will make Rabbah a pasture for camels and Amman a fold for flocks. Uh, these are areas, cities uh, in the Ammonon country. Uh, then you will know that I am he who is. For thus says he who is God, because you've clapped your hands in celebration, applause, and stamped your feet. Yeah, right? Stamping the feet. And rejoiced with all the malice within your soul against the land of Israel. Therefore, behold, I have stretched out my hand against you and will hand you over as plunder to the nations, and I will cut you off from the peoples and make you perish out of the countries. I will destroy you, and then you will know I am he who is. So the, the Ammonites are going to get their comeuppets eventually as the military operations of the Babylonians continue. Verse 8, kind of continue on that theme. Thus says he who is God, because Moab, that's on the east side of the Dead Sea, and it's a brother nation to uh, Ammon, and Seir, that's Mount Seir, which is uh, immediately south and slightly east of the Dead Sea, uh, this is Edom. That's the other name for it. So because Moab and Seir said, Behold, the house of Judah is like all the other nations. And therefore I will lay open the flank of Moab from the cities, from its cities on its frontier, the glory of the country, Beth Jeshemon, Baal Maon, and Kirithayim, all places in Moab. I will give it along with the Ammonites to the people of the east as possession, that the Ammonites may be remembered no more among the nations, and I will execute judgments upon Moab. Then they will know that I am he who is. So because of their bad attitude, Moab's going down too. So that's Ammon and Moab, and here is Mount Seir next, verse 12. Thus says he who is God, because Edom acted revengefully against the house of Judah and has grievously offended in taking vengeance on them. Therefore, thus says he who is God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off from it man and beast. I will make it desolate from Timan even to Dadan. They shall fall by the sword. Places in Edom. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they shall do to Edom, or in Edom, according to my anger and according to my wrath, and they shall know my vengeance, declares he who is God. And all this does come to pass. Once Judah is kind of secured by the Babylonians, then the Babylonians take out all the other area uh, nations, which would include Ammon, Moab, Edom and the Philistine plain as well, uh, what we call the Gaza Strip, uh, and then a little bit to, uh, beyond that to the north and in a little bit. Uh, that's the home territories of the Philistines since way back uh, at the beginning of Israel's history. Uh, they had been uh, under the administration of the Davidic and Solomonic kingdoms. There's been Philistine uprisings from time to time, 
but uh, eventually they settled back down until now. As Judah is coming under Babylonian military uh, attack, the Philistines are happy and think they're going to benefit from it. So God has this prophecy made toward them. Verse 15, Thus says he who is God, Because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy in never-ending enmity, and they have been in recent history here uh, in our story, uh, caused more trouble for the kingdom of Judah. In fact, they kidnapped some of the members of the royal family uh, and killed some of the members of the royal family. And so God is now saying, because you've been doing all that, verse 16, therefore thus says he who is God, behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will cut off the Kiritites, and destroy the rest of the seacoast. I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am he who is when I lay my vengeance upon them. So they're going to get whacked as well by the Babylonians. Uh, by the time that these uh, things are being written down that we're looking at right now, uh, the Philistines have already suffered a little bit at the hands of the Babylonians. But 